Good morning, everyone. Hey, leaning a little heavy to the left today, but uh, I'm not sure why we're uh, so strong on that side, but lots of young people down the front there filling up the numbers, so maybe that's part of it. Thanks to Keith and everyone who's uh, assisted with our worship this morning. I'm ready for that PowerPoint when you guys are. Okay, football, meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars. What on earth could this have to do with uh, any sermon? Well, you're about to find out. Of course, it was an advertising jingle used once to convince you that a Holden car was a quintessentially Australian car. And for those above a certain age, this will bring back a flood of memories of the jingle. If, on the other hand, you weren't very conscious during the 70s in Australia, here's a little snapshot. Australia, what's your favourite sport? Football, snack, pies, animal, kangaroos. And what's your favourite car, Australia? Holden! Let me see, that's football, meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars, huh? Right! Well, you sure sound like Australia to me. We are! Well, then you better tell me again, because I just might forget. We love football, meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars. Football, meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars. That's football, meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars. I can't get that image out of my head. It was just so perfectly timed to meat pies as well. (laughs) The interesting thing about that advertising campaign, and uh, it was obviously sounded very Australian, but it was actually an adaptation of a US ad for Chevrolets, which was, we love baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. There was even a South African version as well. But like I say, the whole point of that ad was to convince you that a Holden car was something that was synonymous with Australia. So footballs, meat pies, kangaroos and holding cars. What would be the Adventist equivalent? The Sanctuary, 1844 and the Investigative Judgment. This is seen or has been seen as the quintessential essence of what it means to be a true Adventist. Of course, it was a doctrine that has had its challenges over the years. And uh, in fact, a number of Adventists have gotten in trouble for disputing this doctrine. Uh, In the 80s, a number of church pastors even lost their employment as a result of this. But why is it that this particular doctrine has been so controversial? In fact, one of the early Adventist value genesis surveys where they interviewed a bunch of young people in the church, in the survey, a high number of Adventist youth, in fact, 98% of young Adventists agreed on the truth of this, of the Sabbath doctrine, whereas 42% were undecided or in disagreement with the doctrine of the sanctuary. So the question has to be asked, why were young people strongly supportive of one particular doctrine and yet seemingly unsure or uncertain about the other one? Now, of course, as I mentioned, there was a lot of controversy in uh, Adventist history uh, in relation to this. And for many, 1844 became the test of whether someone was a true Adventist or not, or whether they were orthodox or not. And so to not be seen as reinforcing the traditional understanding was seen as disloyal and even heretical. And for those who were willing to speak about the doctrine, they often moved into a defensive position. And that meant they were trying to prove that the the date of 1844 was in fact valid. And so it was possible that for some the impression might have been given that the essence of this teaching was all to do with a particular date in history. Now, to a new generation of Adventists growing up, they wondered what the whole drama of this was all about. It might be a bit like arguing over whether Jesus was crucified in AD 31 or AD 33. You know, interesting to speculate, but not really that, uh, not not much in terms of relevance. So another factor that can also perhaps highlight this difference in uh, loyalty to this particular uh, doctrine has to do with the generational outlook. And this is something that has changed over time as well. Those babies that were born after World War II, and I'm thinking of baby boomers, baby busters, Gen Xs, Gen Ys, and seem to keep going through the alphabet. But the point is there are certain differences in outlook that are characterised or part of each of these generations. And while these differences in generational outlook are, you know, They're not a concrete thing, but they are trends that sociologists have observed and noticed. So the main difference in regard to these 
generations is, first of all, that pre-war babies tend to have a very objective outlook, emphasizing the facts and what things mean. Whereas post-war babies tend to have a more subjective outlook, more concerned about how things feel. And this has a number of implications in terms of how people process information. So when it comes to differences in relation to outlook in theory versus how pragmatic people are, this manifests itself in terms of the pre-war babies are very much into the theories, beliefs are very much right or wrong, and terms of Adventism, you know, we have the truth, you'll hear that often uh, resonated strongly. And so they strongly associate with that concept of truth is about what is factual and correct. Whereas post-war babies tend to be more interested in the practice is more important than theory. And so beliefs are significant as they have meaning, or if they're unmeaningful, then they're considered irrelevant. And even if they're true, they're not really cared about or concerned about them. Of course, this also has impacted in terms of how generations view institutions. Pre-war babies tend to be very loyal to institutions, and particularly the church, whereas post-war babies are less loyal to institutions in general, but that has had an effect in terms of their loyalty to the church. And so that can mean that people are like, well, just because the church tells me to think that, I'm not going to necessarily believe that. So you have a, a different sort of outlook there when it comes to being... Uh, when it comes to church loyalty. So, of course, for pre-war babies, truth is a very objective reality, whereas post-war babies, truth is what works and has meaning in my life. And so this is a different perspective in terms of what's important and what is significant. And so we find ourselves looking at things when it comes to church doctrine. And so when it comes to pre-war babies, they look for the church that has the right doctrines, the correct doctrines, the truth, Whereas for post-war babies, they look for a church that meets their practical needs of love, acceptance, and belonging. And truth plays a role, of course, but it's a secondary consideration to the comfort or the characteristics of the environment, the sense of community that they experience. So these differences have an impact when it comes to looking at this church teaching in relation to the sanctuary. And that manifests in terms of... Pre-war babies have tended to view the sanctuary in terms of the... The truth of it, the theory of it, the timelines, the historical facts, also in terms of the validity of the date. And of course, obviously, the Adventist history grew out of the Great Disappointment, and so this date has had significance for Adventists uh, because of that. But for post war babies, when it comes to the sanctuary doctrine, they are looking more in terms of what does that actually mean, or how does that affect my life today? And it also has relevance in terms of what is the truth of this doctrine because it again relates to meaning and significance. Now, I had a lecturer at college who pointed out that every one of our key fundamental beliefs should end with two words and those two words are so what. In other words the Bible says this but so what. What does it actually mean for us in terms of our day-to-day -day living? And of course, when it comes to looking at the sanctuary doctrine, if I was to ask you all today, what do you see as the essence of the sanctuary doctrine? I imagine we would come up with a range of different responses. And uh, it would probably even reflect your generation of when you were uh, born as well as to how you perceive that as well. So the first, when it comes to exploring the meaning of the sanctuary doctrine, and that's what I want to focus on today, because I want to answer the so what question. So what does this actually mean? And I believe the first key thought has to do with Christian assurance because if Jesus Christ is our mediator and high priest, then this has meaning and significance in that's where we derive our Christian assurance from. But the flip side of, flip side of the meaning of the sanctuary doctrine relates to Christian responsibility. And that is, if Christians and non-Christians will be judged, then... Obviously, that has some significance that we need to take on board as well. So let's have a look at some of this in a bit more detail. So the first point is that in terms of Christian assurance, this helps us understand and helps us to realize that we can approach God with confidence. And Hebrews chapter 10 gives us an insight as to why we can approach God with confidence. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, 
that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So you have here two key aspects that I believe formulate the foundation of the essence of the meaning or the significance of this uh, teaching. Now, of course, to understand the significance of being able to approach God with confidence, we have to understand what it was like to grow up as a Jew. And, of course, that meant that as soon as sin entered the world, there was this great barrier between us and God. Adam and Eve tried to hide from God. They didn't feel comfortable in God's presence. And, of course, for the Israelites, this meant that they had a limited access to God. God was kind of scary. You know, when the Ten Commandments were handed out, there was sort of specific instructions to stay away from the foot of Mount Sinai and, uh, you know, thunder rumbling and, you know, you didn't want to mess with God. God was a holy being and it literally could cost you your life if you were to put yourself in the wrong position. Even touching the tabernacle was pretty much instant death. And even when it came to the most holy place, the very presence of God in the sanctuary, um, this was not something that people would just walk into. In fact, it was only entered once a year by the high priest and there was a lot of process involved in being made right with God to be worthy of entering into that most holy place on behalf of the people. So unless you've lived as a Jew, you probably tend to neglect the fact of what it means to have operated in an environment where God's presence was holy and as a sinful human being, you did not want to sort of get on the wrong side of that. So firstly, we notice in this Bible text that the only reason we can have confidence in approaching God is because of the blood of Jesus. And this is significant because it's only through Christ that we can approach God confidently. In and of ourselves, sinners cannot stand to survive in the presence of a holy God. It's only because Jesus' blood has been uh, shed on our behalf that we have the opportunity and the possibility to approach God confidently. But of course, growing up a Christian, we we sort of take for granted the fact that we can have this access to God. Whereas had you grown up in a Jewish environment, then you would see the radical change that came about because of what Jesus had done on the cross. It's a bit like having a good car to drive. When I was uh, young, I inherited this car. It was about 30 years old at the time. But uh, those of you who are car enthusiasts will know that the uh, Datsun 1600 was a legend of its time. quite uh, competent in the rally world. But if you had a good car, you, don't, you take a lot of things for granted. You take for granted that the car will start when you get in it. And fortunately, this only broke down twice, this one. But you also take for granted the fact that you have air conditioning and uh, heating, whereas this car, the air conditioning was controlled by winding down the window. And the heating, well, when it even worked at all, it was offset by the fact that there seemed to be cold air that was able to find its way into the cabin. So I still remember driving into Newcastle with my wife wrapped up in a blanket trying to keep warm in this car, but at least I knew she didn't love me for my car. But of course, when you have a better car, you don't appreciate all the things that come with a good car, whereas when you have an old car and then you go to a good car, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this car is so good. And so in a similar way, for those who had lived under the Old Testament scenario or covenant When they came to understand the significance of Jesus' death on the cross, this was like an amazing transformation, a whole new way of doing life that uh, meant that they had access to God in a way that had previously never been been possible. So a couple of uh, texts in the Bible I want to share with you that just highlight this change from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. So we have in Hebrews 8, 6, But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the the covenant of which he is a mediator is as superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. So we have here a contrast between the Old Testament priestly ministry and the new covenant of which Jesus is the mediator. Hebrews 10 has a similar concept in mind where it says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, 
He sat down at the right hand of God. So you can see there the key words there, that the Old Testament uh, model was having to be repeated again and again. And even though these sacrifices occurred every day, they weren't actually able to meaningfully take away sins. They were pointing forward to a time when Jesus would do that. They also had to be offered over and over again until Jesus was able to completely fulfill that promise and sit down at the right hand of God. So you see that Jesus' sacrifice made a significant difference in that it bridged the barrier, it bridged the gap between us and God so that each one of us could have a personal relationship with God. It means that we can approach God directly. We don't have to go through an earthly priest. It means that we don't have to cringe in our approach to God. We can can come before God openly and honestly and uh, approach him with our true feelings. We don't have to be scared and living in fear. But of course, access to God is something that as Christians we take for granted because you know, even if you wanted to talk to the managing director or the CEO of a big company, if you just walk into the front desk, you probably not going to be able to get to see them because, you know, there's sort of a collection of administration and secretaries that will keep you uh, from getting up to the top person. And in a similar way, it would be like if uh, Scott Morrison walked in and met or bumped into you on the street and said, hey, here's my personal uh, mobile phone number. You can give me a call anytime you like. Of course, there's no way that a prime minister is just going to go handing out his personal mobile phone number. And yet, in a sense, when Jesus died on the cross, every one of us had access to the Father in a way that we'd never previously ever thought possible. So it means that we have assurance of salvation because we have access to the Father. The second thing it means is that Jesus identifies with our struggles. Now, because Jesus is our high priest, the fact that he lived here on this earth as a human gives him an insight and a perspective that Otherwise, he wouldn't have had. So we read in Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, and it says, Therefore, since we have a great priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, of course, Jesus lived on this earth, which was an incredible condescension that he would be willing to give up his divine status and actually come down onto this world. But it means that while he was on this earth, he voluntarily gave up his divine capabilities. It means that he was, as a result, he felt fatigue, he felt weariness, he felt pain, he felt suffering, he felt hunger, he felt what it was to experience anguish, He felt what it was to experience denial and abandonment by those closest to him. He experienced disappointment and discouragement and distress. All of these are integral parts of what it means to be a human being. And Jesus has experienced all of these dynamics in terms of knowing what it was like to be fully human. Jesus experienced trials and temptations And because of that, he's able to empathize with us in the challenges that we experience in life. The fact that he, the fact that we fail and makes mistakes, and our and our mediator understands what that's like. Not that he made the mistakes, but he understands the the temptation. He understands the way we feel when we are encountering difficulties and difficult challenges. He's more understanding of what it's like in our situation. Of course, empathy is a challenge sometimes for us. Uh, This cartoon pictures somebody who's just come out of a car wreck and uh, the bystander comforts them with the words of, oh, you should have seen my accident happen like this. Of course, no one wants to hear about that when you've just been through your own crisis yourself. This doctor says, I think you'll find I'm one of the most empathetic doctors around. And if you look in the mirror, you'll uh, see he's taken empathy to a new level. But of course, the fact that Jesus can understand what it's like, it means that he uh, is in a position to better understand the struggles that we go through in life. And that should bring us comfort, especially when we pray to God that we know that he understands. Our next verse suggests that 
our sins are covered by Jesus' constant intercession on our behalf. And so because Jesus died on the cross, the sanctuary doctrine teaches this concept that in heaven Jesus intercedes on our behalf and applies the merits of, his, of what he achieved on the cross on our behalf. So Jesus ascended to the right hand of God and that should not be understood as a position of inactivity or rest, but rather the right hand of God is seen as a place of distinction and power. And so this is why the disciples were so keen to sit at Jesus' right hand. But Hebrews 7 tells us that but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So here's this reference to Jesus functioning as our intercessor in heaven. Notice also that it's a permanent priesthood, whereas the Old Testament priesthood, there were a number of different priests, there were sacrifices that had to happen on and off. In heaven, Jesus has achieved a once-for-all sacrifice. And because of this, and because of the value of that sacrifice, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. And of course, this is a mercy that we experience that is of great comfort to us, or should be of great comfort, to know that Jesus is interceding on our behalf. As it says in 1 John 2, 1, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And this shouldn't be understood as Jesus going, Oh, you know, David's not such a bad guy. You know, can't we let him into heaven? And, you know, God the Father's like, Hmm, don't think so. Rather, Jesus and the Father have the same desire to save us. The difference is that because Jesus can intercede on our behalf, he can say that, I died for David, and because of him accepting that offer of salvation, that's why he is able to come into heaven. And so in this sense, Jesus functions as our advocate. Some translations say our defense lawyer. He's working on our behalf to be able to make it possible for us to be able to go into heaven. And so if we accept God's grace and we respond to it, then we don't need to live in fear. We don't need to worry about judgment because we have the promise that Jesus is able to save us completely. And because salvation is God's work, we take note to recognize that any good thing we do is because of the results of Jesus working through us. But we have Christian assurance because Jesus Christ is our mediator and high priest. He identifies with our struggles and he is still acting on our behalf, applying the merits of the cross for our salvation so that we can experience true reconciliation and peace. Now, of course, when it comes to the meaning of sanctuary doctrine, on the one hand, we have Christian assurance, which is highlighted very obviously by the fact that Jesus is our mediator and works on our behalf. It also means that it's God's work and not ours. As it says there, therefore, he's able to completely save those who have come to God through him because he lives to intercede for us. But the flip side of this theme of Christian assurance has to do with Christian responsibility. And of course, when the church has often preached about hellfire in the past, there's often been a degree of fear in relation to it. And so you see this bald preacher has uh, three different wigs, depending on if he's preaching the old-time gospel or he's got the hell and revelation wig, which is hair standing on end. This next preacher is uh, getting ready to preach his sermon on hell, and he's just cranking the temperature up a bit to uh, help to create the right environment. And this church is welcoming sinners, putting the fear of God into folks since 1874. The church hasn't always done a good job when it comes to the concept of judgment. In fact, often the church has used judgment as a way of scaring people into church or scaring people into the kingdom of God. And I don't believe that this is in the nature of God. You know, it says in 1 John that true love casts out all fear. So if God is a God of love, then he's not in the business of using fear as a motivator to bring us into the kingdom of God. I came across a uh, record of a sermon once where the uh, preacher was describing uh, basically this scenario of when we get to heaven. And so he commented that uh, while they were in heaven, that they would be in a position where they would be able to go and see this from this bridge overlooking the valley to be able to see their relatives suffering in hell while they're in heaven. 
And he says, one of the joys of the saints is to go out onto this bridge and view these poor souls. They see friends and relatives. This view is a feast for their eyes. Now, I don't know about you, but that is not my picture of heaven. Um, and yet, this is the way the church has sometimes used hellfire as a, as a kind of a fear campaign of made scaring people into the kingdom of God. One of the interesting things, though, when it comes to understanding the New Testament is that while it says very clearly that we're saved by grace, it often says that we're judged by works. And this can unsettle us a bit, but we have to really understand and come to terms with what salvation actually means and what judgment actually means. Because for a Jew, salvation and judgment were something that was seen as a united package. And so judgment, in a sense, was bringing an end to the whole sin problem. And it meant that all of the people that had wronged you, those wrongs would be set right. And so judgment was looked forward to as something positive, as a time when God would fix up the injustices of this world. So when it comes to the sanctuary doctrine, there is this element of Christian responsibility that is highlighted. It means that God cares about our actions. And of course, there are several judgment scenes you know, in Daniel and Revelation where there's reference to books and books being opened and some kind of human record of actions that have been taken and done. So the fact that we are going to be judged one day means that we can't fool God. We can't just pretend to do what we want and think that God's going to be thrilled about it. But on the other side of the coin, is it's important to recognize that this judgment scenario is not us standing before God alone, because we remember the other aspect of the sanctuary doctrine has to do with Christian assurance. And the Christian assurance is that we have a mediator, an advocate, or a defense lawyer on our behalf. And it's because of that that we can have confidence when it comes to facing the judgment. The fact that uh, we will in fact be judged also means that there is a transcendent moral order. Now, the common thinking today is that, you know, pretty much anything goes, whatever's good for you is good for you, and you know, whatever bar bizarre thing you want to do, well, as long as you don't hurt anyone else, that's okay. But if there is a creator God, and if there is a transcendent moral order, then it does also mean that there is a sense of right and wrong, and then there is a degree of uh, responsibility in terms of how we live our lives. And so when it comes to this aspect, that's another aspect that you'll find unpacked in terms of this doctrine. Third, it means that we must remain faithful in order to be saved. There's a couple of verses there you can look at later. But ultimately, the, the key thought here is that talk is cheap. You know, anyone can say they're a Christian. You know, you can say, I'm the best husband in the world. But if you treat your wife badly, then obviously it's just talk. There's no substance to it. And so in the same way, we can say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. And then pretty much even get baptized and then go on living totally your own life selfishly from then on and not really being open to doing life in partnership with God. And so Jesus said, you know, just because you even do miracles in my name doesn't necessarily mean that you're in a relationship with me. In fact, he says, away from me. I don't even know who you are. And so this concept of Christian responsibility reminds us that, you know, being saved is not just about accepting and taking the forgiveness and then being your law unto yourself from that point on. It's also about recognizing that if we want to accept salvation and if we're grateful for that, we also want to live our lives with a sense of in partnership with God. We want to do what God wants us to do because we recognize that he knows what's best for us. Now, having said that, we all fall short of that and we all make bad choices at times. But that's where we remind ourselves that Jesus is our mediator and that there is forgiveness available. Fourthly, it means that sin and its effects are only temporary. And this is important to recognize because if God didn't deal with the sin problem once and for all, we would be stuck in this sort of imperfect world forever. But the fact that God wants to bring an end to this, the only way he can really eradicate sin is through some kind of judgment process. In other words, if those who don't want to be in heaven are given the right to choose, then God also is given the right to allow them to let consequences naturally unravel. So it's a bit like a laptop computer saying, you know, I don't want to be plugged into the PowerPoint, just let me be my own person, unplug me. And of course, 
the battery will dwindle to the point where the laptop will cease to function. And so in a similar sense, if we say to God, you know, if God is the source of life and we say, you know what, I just want to live my own life. I don't want to have anything to do with God. Ultimately, God will allow the consequence of that to, to become apparent. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So interestingly, judgment is described as coming from the sanctuary in heaven, and yet also salvation is described as coming from the sanctuary in heaven. So you see these two aspects of this heavenly sanctuary playing out in terms of Christian responsibility and also Christian assurance. And I think this is significant because it's highlighting the fact that these two aspects of Christian assurance and Christian responsibility, if they're held neatly in check, they give us a, a balance that helps us to avoid the extreme of cheap, cheap grace where you just get saved and then do whatever you want and it doesn't really matter. Or on the other hand, you've got the other side of the coin where you've got... Uh, so much responsibility that it's almost like a legalistic trying to be good enough for God, trying to get God's favor. And of course, no one, honestly, if they're true to themselves, realizes that they're capable of doing that. So on the one hand, you have these two extreme ways of following God. On one hand, you're a, you know, a rule to your own self. And on the other hand, you're kind of begging God to save you because you don't feel like you're good enough. But when we put these two things together, we have a sense of Christian responsibility and we also have a sense of Christian assurance. And putting the two together helps us to hold them in balance and avoid distortions. Viewing the good news of salvation in the context of God's judgment stops us from being smug and self-satisfied. But it also helps us to remember that we need Jesus Christ to function as our high priest. We need his forgiveness and we need his acceptance and his love and mercy and grace so that we can actually face judgment with confidence. And so this means that when it comes to living our lives, we live our lives with an awareness of our need of our Saviour. Because none of us would have any hope if it wasn't for the promise of salvation that's been made available through Jesus. It also means we are conscious of the fact that what we do matters in this life. It's not just a matter of saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, and then treating people badly and doing all sorts of horrible things. It grows out of the fact that you know, we are responsible beings who God has entrusted us with the power of choice. And every day we make choices that are either good for people or ourselves or not so good for people or ourselves. We make decisions that either lead us into a closer relationship with God or they take us further away from God. So I want to highlight today two key thoughts, which I want to encourage you to keep both of these in your mindset when it comes to following Christ. The first has to do with Christian assurance, and this grows out of Jesus Christ functioning as our mediator and our high priest. And the second one is Christian responsibility. The fact that there is a judgment shouldn't be something that scares us because we have an advocate in Jesus. And because of what Jesus has achieved for us on the cross and what he's achieving for us in heaven, we have a sense of security. We have full assurance that we are in right relationship with God. But it only comes about from that connection and that relationship with Jesus. It's not something that we can manufacture or be good enough in and of ourselves. So when it comes to answering the so what question, I believe the sanctuary doctrine helps to give us a balanced perspective when it comes to salvation. It helps us understand and know and rely on our need of Jesus. And it helps us to recognize that judgment is required to bring an end to sin. But that will be a good thing because that will then mean that there is a better, reali better reality beyond this world. There will be a time where we'll be reunited with God in heaven and there will be no crying, there will be no more tears, there will be no more sadness, there will be no, none of the challenges that we experience here in this earth because of what Jesus achieved on the cross for us. So as we go through this week, may we remember our need of Jesus and the importance and the value of what he's achieved on the cross and also the benefits of that that he applies in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen.